What is up guys? It's your boy Rick Kakis and today we've got some brand spanking new Destiny 2 news, courtesy of the Bungie weekly update that has just gone live, revealing official information. And guys, if you thought last week's update was huge where Bungie went over all of the massive mid-season changes, well, they say this one is even bigger. So get a comfy place to sit, grab a cold beverage, and get ready for some huge Destiny 2 information. And so, let's get started. But just before we do, under here! Guys, I got a big problem. I told my wife this video was sponsored by Marvel Strike Force, an awesome game where you can make a team consisting of heroes and villains from throughout the multiverse. Guardians of the Galaxy, X-Men, Avengers, everything awesome you can think of. Here's the problem. My wife kind of only heard the Marvel part. Okay, it's gonna be sponsored by Marvel. Yeah, that Marvel. I'm pretty sure you can get the guy that plays Thor to come to our kid's birthday party. I don't know what to do, but what you but what you can do is download Marvel Strike Force today. Assemble the ultimate squad with your favorite Marvel characters and outfit and upgrade those characters to become even stronger. But don't forget to strategize by pairing up certain heroes and villains to form synergies to get that W. And synergies keep expanding because new characters are constantly being added. This month, be on the lookout for the brand new Hive Mind team. Silver Surfer and Ghost Spider are getting brand new symbiote versions that you can see here. Pair them alongside other symbiotes like Venom and Carnage for insane new synergies. So guys, if you scan the QR code you can see right here or click the link in the description down below, you're actually gonna get a brand new free champion Echo to celebrate the release of Marvel Studios Echo. And also don't forget to use the promo code VENOMGIFT for even more goodies, guys. What are you waiting for? Definitely check it out. All right, now, first things first, what's been going on this week for Destiny 2? Well, I do have an important update for you guys. With the weekly reset, there was a new Riven's Wishes quest, and in my video covering it, I gave a big warning to free-to-play players, because even though it lets free-to-play players collect the Red Border Raid weapons, if you actually unlock enough of those to craft the pattern, it was telling players that you had to buy the Forsaken pack, which of course was incredibly scummy by Bungie because there was no indication that you would need it if it was giving you the weapons, right? Like, it was just totally shady. Thankfully, a few hours after my video, I'm not saying my video did it, but they did come out with an update saying that they are going to fix this. In a future patch, you will be able to craft those raid weapons even if you're completely free to play. So just wanted to give you guys that information. Now, let's move on to the brand new information within the TWAB. And that information is coming from the PvP Strike Team. This is a group of developers tasked with kind of fixing PvP. Uh, their main focus are going to be on these five major issues. Crucible maps, rewards, game modes, sandbox issues, and matchmaking. So let's talk first about Crucible maps. Now, they do say different modes require different kinds of maps to succeed, and our limited map selection means that we often pushed modes onto maps where they're not necessarily optimal, resulting in subpar player experience. Our current crop of maps has not been updated in some time, in terms of spawns, ammo crate locations, zones, etc. And this is exasperating the issue, while we continue to add newer modes to old maps. An example would be the maps made for rift being used for clash and control like disjunction the citadel convergence and cathedral of dusk to help with this they have made some substantial quality of life passes on existing maps and you can see some of the changes right here and then they say with update 7.5.3 on March 5th, there's going to be additional map spawning quality of life passes. They're addressing spawn traps for Eternity and Fortress. They're removing all backfield spawns for non-rift modes in the Citadel, Cathedral of Dusk, Disjunction, and Convergence. This will effectively make these maps play 30 to 50% smaller than they currently do and reduce the amount of time spent running back after combat spawning. 
there's going to be major tuning of the initial spawning heavy ammo crate and tiebreaker zones for all of these maps we're also making changes to our workflows that will allow us to update the above variables more easily in the future we'll be able to more quickly address issues with map imbalance and spawning for example the next time dead cliffs returns in trials it will have changes made to the spawn zones and heavy ammo placement to make it more balanced. They then say crucible focused players also feel left behind in terms of locations as they get less exposure to the awesome new destinations that come out with releases. For example, Europa and Neomuna have exciting palettes that our PvP focused players rarely get to experience. In May, we're releasing new maps that explore these locations. While these maps will be available in control, they have been specifically built with a focus on 3v3 game mode in mind, including uh, Dominion, Clash, Survival, and the newest mode, Collision. So, here are the three new maps. I don't think they've ever revealed these uh, yet, so here we go. We have Eventide Labs, that takes place on Europa. Then we have uh, Cyrus Plaza, which takes place on Neomuna. And then Dissonance, which takes place on the Terraformed Pyramid Ship. So, that is awesome. I would imagine labs, like it could be uh, icy or it could be kind of in where the Braytech laboratory is located and very futuristic. Like it could kind of be either one of those. Uh, the plaza on Neomuna, well, that's likely going to just be like, you know, built up in that city area, which is super cool. And then the Terraform Pyramid ship is going to be very similar to the Root of Nightmares Ray. So moving on from there, guys, we have the next section, which is rewards. So, Bungie says, we want Crucible to feel at least as rewarding as PvE, with post-game drops on par with strike activities in terms of rewarding materials and activity-specific loot. We also want PvP players to have more consistent methods of being rewarded with build crafting materials. This has led us to make the following changes, which are currently available in-game, and you can see them right here. Now, they continue and say, while some players may choose to play only a few competitive games per week, we'd like to reward players who continue to remain active. In competitive, we'll be offering two major incentives for continued success throughout the week. And that leads us to Artifice Armor in Competitive Crucible. Guys, this is huge. Artifice Armor previously only came from Master Difficulty Dungeons. So again, this is a big deal. Artifice Armor is just straight up better than normal armor and will significantly improve your account and improve the amount of stats you can have if you have all Artifice Armor on a character. So here's how it's gonna work. This high stat armor will be obtainable as a reward from a new third tier on the competitive division weekly challenge. After completion of the weekly challenge, Artifice Armor will continue to have a chance to drop on further victories. These Artifice Armor pieces are giving the Year 1 Crucible gear a new lease on life. The following will have a chance to drop as Artifice Armor from Competitive Crucible, and you can see kind of the list of the armor pieces coming back right here. But wait, there's more. So they say another key change, we're adding an update 7.3.5, which is coming on March 5th, is the increased drop chance for exotic weapon catalysts on victories. Like Artifice Armor, this offers a meaningful way to upgrade a Guardian's power while rewarding continued competitive success. You can see those changes right here. And there's even more. So specifically with Trials of Osiris, Bungie says, we want to strike a better balance between the effort versus reward equation for going flawless while also increasing reward options for players who cannot go flawless. To that end, we recently added flawed card rewards, but also with the next update, we'll update the Passage of Ferocity and add a new Passage of Persistence. So already live in Trials, they added a 50% chance to get a Trials weapon on wins, but with the upcoming update, this will be updated to exclusively drop the weekly weapon reward to better allow for targeted farming on the specific weapon you want that is awesome honestly then when that update hits guys we're making the following changes to the trials passages so for passage of ferocity if you have not been flawless for the week 
Losses after three wins will reset you back to three wins instead of flying your card. That is a crazy big change. So you're basically going to, if you do like lose, instead of having to restart, you're always going to start at three wins. So you only need to get, you know, those four more wins. But after that, we have the all new passage of persistence. And this is pretty crazy. So losses following a win will remove the win from your card. Consecutive losses do not remove additional wins. Getting to seven wins grants you a drop of the weekly adept weapon regardless of how many losses you have taken. So this passage works like a trailing backstop. Once you have at least one win recorded on the passage, a loss will remove the most recent win instead of flawing the passage. Since consecutive losses will not remove additional wins, Winning two games in a row adds a permanent win to the card, and win streaks longer than two add additional permanent wins. So if you win three in a row and then lose, you'll go back to two wins. And if you lose again, doesn't matter. You'll stay at those two wins, and then you can like win two more, and like every kind of streak you go on, you're going to advance this card. Now, here's the thing. You can only go flawless on this passage if you do not have a win removed. Once a win has been removed, you can no longer get flawless using this passage, but you can still earn a roll of the weekly adept weapon. So basically, this is going to be the easiest way to get those adept weapons. It might be less efficient because like, it's gonna take a lot longer if you are losing to complete this card and you will get that adept weapon, but you won't technically go flawless. Like you won't be able to fly to the lighthouse and get those type of rewards but, but again, you'll still get the adept weapon. But next up, another big change here is that they're adding rewards for match completions by three person fire teams in trials. Although you do not need to win to earn these rewards, they are participation gated. So simply jumping off the map or sitting AFK in spawn will disqualify you from getting them. So you have a, an additional 50% chance to drop the non-adept trials weekly weapon reward, a 50% chance to get a trials engram drop, and additional trials reputation. So the goal of these changes is to encourage players to team up with friends uh, with loss being less of a punishment, players can have more fun and be well rewarded while doing so. So this could really up the trials numbers. Like again, like if you've been staying away from trials, like with these changes, man, it's going to be really easy to get trials rewards. And like, who cares about going flawless if you are a more casual player? You don't need the adept weapon. Just the normal weapon can give you some amazing god rolls, and then you can use that god roll weapon to maybe go flawless in the future, right? Now, moving on from there, guys, we, uh, the next section is game modes. So, they say, Right now, competitive modes are not at the bar of quality to best promote an exhibition of skill and mastery between teams. We recently updated the Countdown Rush rule set in competitive and are introducing a new King of the Hill mode called Collision to Crucible Labs in update 7.3.5. The goal is to replace Countdown Rush in the competitive playlist after testing. We also feel like our quick play modes are lagging in updates. Even though new modes are being made, they have been either a party mode like Relic or limited time modes like Iron Banner Fortress, Eruption, and Tribute. Outside of those, players have had the same options for too long. We want to make new core modes available to the standardized playlists and private matches. We also want to experiment with interesting twists on Destiny's PvP that still retain the core feeling of of our gameplay without uh, being limited time events. So they say already live, you have like Sparrow Control and stuff like that. And with update 7.3.5, 3v3 Clash will be moving to the 3v3 Quick Play Rotator and will be making uh, these updates to the rules you can see right here. A new 3v3 King of the Hill mode collision will enter Crucible Labs. And you can read how it works uh, below. And then Iron Banner Tribute has undergone multiple changes, including and gives you all that stuff right there. And then they say in update 7.3.6, which is not 
early March. I don't know when this is coming, but they say Checkmate will be back in Crucible Labs returning in a form closer to its original iteration. There's going to be a new modifier hardware that will be tested in labs where there's no abilities, only weapons. And then we have uh, in the final shape here, guys, private matches have more options for players to set per mode. So modifiers to, such as Mayhem or Scorched will be options in any uh, game mode. And they have added more custom tuning for existing game modes so they have better control over things like special ammo delivery, ability cooldowns, reviving, respawning, and more. Whew, but moving on from there, the next section is sandbox issues, addressing problems across the skill curve. So, first off, they talk about some of PvP's problems. As the average skill of our players has crept up over the years, uh, the weapon sandbox has not grown alongside it. This has led to a compression of the skill gap at high levels of play. They also say that too often the defeated player in PvP can't understand what killed them or why. They also want to provide more encouragement for players to master their primary gun skills instead of just spamming abilities. But they do say these problems at their core are all all related to a series of linked issues. We have certain ability builds with either higher uptime or higher potency than we believe is healthy. We've provided a near constant availability of special ammo, which means there is a surplus of one-shot kill weapons on the field, and we've made primary weapons highly lethal, fast killing, and in general also very forgiving. This all leads to a high percentage of deaths in our sandbox where, from a target's perspective, it feels like there was nothing they could have done differently. So, they then talk about what they're doing to fix that. In update 7.3.5, there is a significant crucible balancing shakeup. So, for example, player health is increasing by 30 HP. You have all these cooldown changes, and I'm going to just leave this on screen because we actually covered pretty much all of these changes within last week's TWAB talking about the balancing update. So again, you guys can see all of that uh, right here. But in terms of other changes in the final shape, they say we're working on changes to reduce the dominance of Ward of Dawn and Well of Radiance. Oh boy. <laughs> then we also want to improve the viability of supers with longer recharge times in objective game modes. We'll have more to share on this as we get closer to the release of the file shape. And then after the file shape, we're also exploring UI updates on the obituary screen that would show the combination of players that killed you rather than just a who dealt the final blow. I think that's actually great because like, you know, you, you get one shot from across the map with a guy with a scout rifle, but you're battling a, a totally different guy and you're like, how did my health get ripped away? So I think that's a good idea. Now, Moving on from there, guys, ooh, we have yet another section here, matchmaking details. You know what? I'm going to open a cold beverage for myself, actually. So here's what they're doing. So you can see the already live changes above in terms of matchmaking. And then with update 7.3.5, we will be updating our playlist tooltips to correctly display which matchmaking style is used for each mode. And we have several changes planned for our ongoing experimentation with snake draft lobby balancing aimed at improving how it handles fire teams. Now, after that, guys, they talk about their matchmaking systems and kind of how they work. It's really old information, but they do want to clear up some misconceptions. They say our matchmaking systems do not individually force players uh, to a 1.0 kill death ratio or a 50% win ratio, intentionally allow players to dominate for a few games, then place them into games where they get destroyed, sacrifice connection quality for skill or any other filter. They say with that specifically, our three most common matchmaking systems, outlier protection, rank based and open skill, keep an average connection quality generally within the same bounds. In fact, outlier protection and rank based have on average slightly better connection quality than open skill due to the increased time they remain in the optimal connection bracket while searching for matches. 
Now, I'm sure this is going to cause a bit of a debate within the community. I mean, let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. I will say like, yeah, you don't intentionally enforce a 50% win-loss ratio, but if you win, you go to higher skill brackets, you verse harder enemies, which makes you lose. Then you go to down in skill brackets, you verse easier enemies. So for a lot of players, that's just going to naturally average out to a 50% win-loss ratio, right? In any event, guys, again, let me know what you think. Everyone loves discussing, discussing matchmaking, not a controversial topic at all. But they do say, so now that we've gone over what they don't do, how exactly do the different matchmaking systems work? To understand that, we must first talk about skill and skill deltas. In our game, the range of player's skill is measured from minus 1,000 to plus 1,000. And the feel of a match can often be determined by the overall skill delta, which is the difference in skill between the highest and lowest players in the game. So games with deltas of less than 500 generally feel competitive, with few or no players outclassed, though there will be a difference in performance between the highest and lowest players. Colloquially, we can refer to this as the sweat zone. With deltas greater than 500 and less than 1000, there will be a noticeable skill variance present, usually enough to avoid games from feeling too sweaty. Some players will be outclassed, but it is unlikely that there will be people in the match who are competitively in over their heads. For well-populated and unranked game modes like Control and Iron Banner, we consider this to be the Goldilocks zone, where games uh, can present a varied experience without becoming stomping grounds. At deltas larger than a thousand, there will be one or more players who get few or no kills the entire game while contributing double digit deaths, we can refer to this as the stomp zone. These experiences result in some of the largest negative sentiment spikes we see in our games and are heavy drivers for player departures. Next up, they have a section on rank-based matchmaking, kind of talking about how it works, but let's get into the specifics down below. They say, in our most recent poll of rank-based matching stats, here are the numbers. 67% of rank-based matches started with converted rank deltas of less than 300 with all three players within three minor ranks. So for example, gold three to gold one. 26% of rank-based matches started with converted rank deltas of more than 300 but less than 500 with all players within five minor ranks. 4% of rank-based matches started with uh, the converted rank deltas of less than five, uh, of more than 500 and less than 600, and then only 3% uh, were rank-based deltas of greater than 600. Next up, we have open skill matchmaking, also known as connection-based matchmaking. So they say this type of matchmaking is used in the Quick Play Playlist, Crucible Labs, Rumble, and the Trials Challenger Pool. So. Here are the numbers from our most recent poll of open skill matchmaking stats. So 2% of open skill matches uh, started with skill deltas of less than 500. 52% occurred in that 500 to 1000 Goldilocks zone we talked about earlier. And then 46% were more than 1000. And then they go on to answer the question, why can't all the non-competitive playlists use open skill? We've been over this debate a million times, uh, but then they have the loose skill-based matchmaking. They say this was our first attempt at loose skill-based matchmaking for more casual play. It's been depreciated, but we will still discuss how it works uh, for comparison purposes. And taking a look at the results here, uh, these were in season 22, 51% of matches started with deltas of less than 500, 45% were in that Goldilocks zone, and then 4% were more than 1,000. So definitely a significant difference, you know, 46% in the stomp zone versus 4% in the stomp zone. But with that being said, I think the factor that Bungie needs to consider, yes, you have negative sentiment when people get stomped too much. Like that's obviously going to happen and there should be outlier protection, all that stuff. But 
There's also a huge amount of players that don't want every single match to feel like an esports tournament, like going down to the wire, right? Like sometimes you just want to hop in and get your dailies done. And often you don't care if you get stomped because that's just a quicker completion. Like who cares, right? So throwing every single player into these like sweaty, sweaty games constantly, you need a bit of variety. You need to get stomped sometimes and stomp other times and have a close match other times. Like having the a variety of all three of those scenarios is what makes makes matchmaking fun in my opinion doing constantly sweaty matches is not fun but also constantly losing or even constantly winning is also not that funny either well i'll be honest constantly winning is fun but again you want to avoid the other two scenarios uh, as much as possible now moving on from there guys they do talk a bit a bit about outlier protection so you can see their explanation right here and here are some typical recent examples of outlier protection stats 25 percent of matches started with skill deltas of less than 500 65 percent in that goldilocks zone and 10 percent in the stop zone and they say this system has allowed us to retain many of the benefits that loose skill-based matchmaking offered for newer and lower skilled players without the drawbacks of making above average skilled players feel uh, like they're playing in something closer to a ranked mode. And okay, so that's pretty cool. Now, moving on from there, guys, we need to talk about fire team based matchmaking. And specifically in Trials of Osiris, it's becoming a big problem. And the problem is that Nobody wants to play in a group of three because if you play in a group of three, you're just against like the best players in the world and cheaters. And that's pretty much it. So people will actually ditch a teammate and just go in with two players to avoid playing with friends. And, and it just creates a super weird dynamic. Like I've had people on my friends list that are like five out of six for Iron Banner or four out of six. And I'm like, hey, can I join? You have room. And they're like, no. We're trying to avoid the fire team based matchmaking. What a weird like thing. Like it used to be you join up with all the fellas, you know, you crack some drinks and then you're in there all six people going at it if you can get a fire team. The bigger the fire team, the better. Now I understand the downsides. If you went in solo, it just wasn't fun. But again, strict fire team based matchmaking has also created some problems. So Bungie talks about a lot of what I just ranted about and they say instead of altering matchmaking we need to focus on making the trio experience more enjoyable and encouraging players to participate by rewarding them as mentioned previously in the rewards section. To recap how we're starting things off we've modified the passage of ferocity and added uh, the new passage of persistence to make getting uh, a first flaws more attainable and allow players who cannot get flaws to still earn adept weapons. Players who play as part of a three-person fire team specifically will be given those additional rewards that we went over earlier. I think this alone is a big change. Like even if you're gonna go and it's way more sweaty, like these rewards will incentivize you to go in there as a three-person fire team for sure. Now moving on from there, we have lobby balancing. So here are the changes already live. They replaced the loose skill-based matchmaking in Iron Banner and Control with the new Outlier Protection matchmaking system. And then in update 7.3.5, we will also cap the win and loss min-max values to make them less variable, which should make point rewards more predictable. And they're currently testing several different configurations of a new snake draft a lobby balancer. And snake draft for lobby balancing, instead of putting like the one high skill player on a team and then all the low skill players on his team versus all the average players, which never goes well for the team with one high skill player, it's like the highest skill player goes to one team. The next highest skill player goes to the other team. Then the next two middle players go to the previous team. And then the other play, like it just kind of goes back and forth and does it that way. Okay, but moving on from there, finally getting out of PVP changes, we have some accessibility and console UI updates. So uh, being introduced in update 7.3.5, they added a reticle location setting to console. So you can have center or below center. And then also added controller dead zone settings and added the ability to adjust the uh, opacity of the radar background. Okay, so cool. Then guys, we got some awesome PVE news. So the Prophecy Dungeon is getting a weapon update. So in update 7.3.5, like holy crap, arriving very soon, 
we'll be updating the weapon pool in the Prophecy Dungeon. This will include swapping out three weapons and making key updates to the other existing weapons. So they are removing a Swift Verdict sidearm, the Long Walk Sniper Rifle, and the Last Breath Auto Rifle. I might need to go in and get the Last Breath because I know that thing can get like demo plus one for all, which is kind of insane. Um, then they're adding a new origin trait for all of the weapons. So it's called Crossing Over. These weapons have increased range and handling for the top half of the magazine, while rounds in the bottom half of the magazine deal increased damage? Wait, 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 wait. Straight up, that could be insanely powerful because even if it's a small increase, let's say it's a 5% damage increase, then you have Rampage or One For All, and then you're in a well. You have all these different things that increase weapon damage depending on whether that damage is multiplicative or additive, and when it's added in the whole calculation for weapon damage, it could turn into a bunch of extra damage. Like That is super, super powerful potentially. And they're also adding uh, weapons with all new perk pools, and in some cases, new damage types. So they're adding the Prosecutor Auto Rifle. So it's a primary precision frame arc auto rifle obviously with the origin trait of uh, the adjudicator submachine gun primary precision frame kinetic and then the relentless pulse rifle primary high impact damage change from kinetic to strand actually and then here is what they've updated so these weapons will be receiving new perk pools and new damage types so the judgment hand cannon primary adaptive frame damage change from kinetic to stasis the darkest before uh, primary rapid fire frame damage change from arc to solar and then the sudden death shotgun special aggressive frame damage change from arc to void uh, then they've updated the encounter drops so the uh, phalanx echo relentless pulse rifle prosecutor auto rifle the cube sudden death shotgun adjudicator submachine gun and the kel echo awards at the emissary chest judgment hand cannon darkest before pulse rifle Wow, I really, like, okay, is it going to, for example, they change the Judgment Hand Cannon. Is that going to change on existing Judgment Hand Cannons? Or now will you have an old kinetic version and a new stasis version? That That's super confusing to me. Honestly, I don't like how they're doing that. If that's the case, that's just more things to fill up your vault, right? Because now you have the two different versions of the same gun, man. And then guys, that is finally it for all of the need to know information this week. Wow, it was a massive one. Let me know down in the comment section what you guys think of all of these changes. Guys, that is it for the video. I hope you enjoyed and found this informative. If you did, please remember to help me out by simply rating and especially sharing this video. If you guys wanna see more Destiny 2 content similar to this, don't be afraid to slap that subscribe button. If you wanna get in touch with me and keep up to date with the latest latest channel activity, the best way is to follow me on Twitter at Rick Kakis that is linked in the description down below. Again, I hope you enjoyed the video and as always, have a good day.